live cell imaging and uh, the use of fluorescent proteins. Okay, you saw this slide yesterday, Asamu Shimarura, and what he did, basically he started looking at jellyfish, wondering what, why do they fluoresce? What, what is going on here? And he was the one that actually isolated this living protein, green fluorescent protein. So the basis of everything we're going to talk about, all this live cell stuff, is all based basically off his curiosity of being able to look at a jellyfish and wondering, hey, why does it fluoresce? What is the reason? And I think, like we talked around here, you do have a lot of other organisms that fluoresce. So, I mean, a lot of properties still to be discovered, a lot of things can be found. But to take something so simple as a jellyfish and just ask that question, it's turned into a whole absolute, its own field of, of study, basically. Okay, so a little bit of the history. Uh, since 1962, they observed it. The gene was actually isolated, which with the gene being isolated is very important to, to uh, work here now in modern biology, like we showed yesterday about how you have to actually clone your gene in front of this gene or the GFP gene you know, in front of your gene. So to get that hybrid protein made that has GFP on part of it and then your protein of interest on part of it. But the really nice thing about GFP, it doesn't really seem to interfere a whole lot. Like a lot of times you think, oh, you put this big tag on something, this extra bit of protein, but a lot of times it doesn't interfere, like has been mentioned in previous talks. So it's a very elegant and very nice system. Okay, they started growing it in uh, E. coli, you know, basic cloning kind of things. And then the color variant started, blue, cyan, yellow. Okay, nice thing is it's a natural protein, okay? You can clone it. And of course, like we just talked about, you put it sequence next to your gene of interest, and then you track it through a living cell. We've seen numerous movies so far uh, and different things using it. It's extremely useful to put a mild there. It is the key to live cell imaging these days. Okay, obviously such a big discovery. Uh, these other gentlemen, Roger Chen especially, that I know of, worked on it. They all shared in the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2008 for basically starting, I mean, really, when you get down to it, these guys are responsible for modern live cell imaging. Okay, numerous colors with numerous properties. Some are naturally occurring. Others have been uh, derived from chemical, uh, you know, modifications and such. That's where they've come up with them, okay? There are numerous, numerous, numerous ones. The thing to keep in mind about them, I think, when you start looking into getting one to use in your work is look at the properties of it. Uh, I, a lot of them are, does it bleach, doesn't it bleach? And again, going back to what I've said again and again and again, if you want to use one, is it going to work in your microscope? Can your microscope recognize those colors? So, you know, think ahead. Plan your experiments in ahead. Uh, things like that. Because... You know, if, if you're using the, you get all the trouble to clone something and all the trouble to make it and then your microscope can't look at it, then it was sort of a, a futile effort, okay? Okay, so let's take here just a quick little movie here. I don't know if we're on the internet, are we? Maybe. Let me take a look. I'm not sure if we are or not. What's it say? No. Okay, but it, it's just a real quick one. You've seen many movies so far about it. It's just some GFP moving within a cell. Not, not as elegant as the ones we saw yesterday. Okay. So the other thing about these is you can use multiple fluorescent proteins in a cell. So you don't just have to be limited to one. Of course, the problem is here is if anybody's done transfections in cells and put proteins into cells, it, it's tough sometimes to get one to express. Two to express might be a little more difficult. Three to express might be even harder yet but it is possible, okay? Uh, I think a lot of this is dependent on cell line. I mean, I'm not an expert in any of that, but a lot of things I see where I work, uh, I, you know, maybe it won't work in this cell line, try a different cell line, use the literature to your advantage as always. Uh, like I said, there's no sense reinventing the wheel every time. Use the literature. If somebody's done it and it's worked, then hey, take advantage of it. Okay? So GFP can not only be transfected into cells, you can actually make transgenic organisms. And uh, the one I use at work a lot is we have a, uh, a, a line of mice where all the blood cell, all the white blood cell lines, all the white blood cell lineages, you know, white blood cells that attack, 
attack infection sites, protect the body, they're all green. So what we'll do is we'll take the, the cells out of that one kind of mouse, and, and all the white blood cells are green fluorescent, we'll inject them into another mouse, have an infection in the eye. So what we're able to do then is we're able to track the infection, how, how it proceeds, how the, how the mouse responds to it, because we're able to follow these green cells from that donor mouse that has green fluorescent white blood cells, and we're able to follow the infection progress and see how the body actually fights it. So a lot of clever ways you can use these things. Here's another one, of course, you know, me being an ophthalmology, where they did it in the rod cells of the retina. They transgenically altered it to, to express GFP, so we were able to study it. And basically what this was to study how the discs were formed in the uh, rods. Okay, so we've talked about just the normal GFP. You know, you put it in the cell, it turns green, you take a look at it, and you follow it. You know, it's your protein, you see where your protein goes, what it does. Well, I'm gonna show you just a couple little tricks. There's a couple little tricks that have come out with these things, uh, photoactivatable and photoconvertible. So what does that mean? Well, photoactivatable basically is the GFP's in there, but it's not really doing anything. It needs activated, so you have to actually hit it with light to get it going. Okay, it's a pretty clever chemical structure to do this. So once you hit it with some light, it'll fluoresce. Okay. So the neat thing about this is you can go around, now we have these lasers, you can draw you know, a spot where you want it. You could actually make the GFP appear in one part of a cell or, or one part of whatever you're working on, and then you're able to you know, just watch that one part and see how it interacts with everything else. Then of course you can you know, activate another part, activate another part and such. So something where it's not GFP continuously, you could turn it on when you want it. So maybe you want to add a drug, you don't want to watch GFP the whole time. Maybe you want to wait for a certain point, you want to activate it at that point. So you have this ability to turn it on when you want to turn it on, okay? So again, it can add to the complexity of the experiment you're trying to do. Photoconvertible. A lot of times I've seen these, we use these for like tracking experiments and stuff. So actually, before the cell here would be red, and by hitting it with light again, with a, a UV light or a blue light, you can change the color of the cell. So again, you can add a different kind of complexity in the cell. Maybe you have a bunch of red cells, you want to see just a macrophage, you could go through and highlight you know, macrophages or, or one subset of cells and see how they work. And then, so you're able to add this, this next level of complexity by being able to change the colors and stuff. Okay, let's see. Okay, the one thing to keep in mind when you work with GFP it's a, it's a living protein, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's degradable. It will fall apart on you. Okay, so some of the things I've seen is a lot of people do the GFP on the live cell and then you know, maybe a couple weeks later they'd like to have that same cell and they'd like to do something else, maybe staying with an antibody or something just to see the relationship. So. You always think GFP live cell, live cell, but you can fix these things. You can preserve them. And from what I've seen, it seems like if you take a GFP cell culture and later on, maybe tomorrow, I'll get into actually uh, a lot of people brought to Sregis' attention about how to prepare tissue and how to prepare cells. I will get into depth with that tomorrow. I, th I think it's going to be tomorrow. It'll be tomorrow or Saturday, but it will, it will happen before the course is over. And I'll supply you with a really nice link where... There's a lot of protocols and they're all very well written, okay? And we'll talk about those too. But at the moment, so you can actually fix GFP. So you could take these cells that are live, you could fix them, uh, hold everything in place, put them in a refrigerator, and you know, come back in a couple weeks and say, oh, I want to stain for this antibody on that cell or something like that. So what I've noticed, or at least the labs I've worked with and stuff, it seems like if you use a week, maybe 2% paraformaldehyde, the GFP will last. It won't degrade it so much. If you fix with other fixatives, such as acetone or methanol, because these are like organics, they, they will destroy the GFP. Okay, so if you do want to preserve your GFP cells or tissue or whatever, you need to be working basically with something like a mild paraformaldehyde. Okay, because again, these will destroy it. Now, a lot of people do the cover slip on a thing, and a lot of people put nail polish. I used to do the same thing years and years and years ago. I don't anymore but I did the same thing. 
So what's the major ingredient in nail polish? Anybody know? Like you get the smell? Acetone. Right, so what did I say right here? Don't use acetone. So we had slides, and it took us a while to figure it out because I, I couldn't quite put my head around it. But we noticed that the whole outside of the slide was like the GFP was just gone. So what it was was the nail polish, the acetone was leaching in underneath the cover slip and just destroying all the GFP on the edge. Okay. Now, another one that you can do is, especially when you go to confocal, like we talked about the, you know, live cell imaging, you got to watch out for photo bleaching, you got to watch out for phototoxicity. Okay. GFP tends to bleach and tends to bleach, uh, you know, fairly well. It's not like an Alexa dye, that's for sure. It will bleach, especially if you hit it with a lot of laser power and such. So the one thing to keep in mind is, okay, you've worked with GFP, you fix the cells, you put it aside. You go to look at it and you're like, where'd my GFP go? It just, it's there probably. So a lot of times what we'll do, especially for confocal, like if we want to get that really pretty image or something later on down the road, we will actually go in and use an antibody, I guess the anti-GFP antibody, and then you know use a primary antibody, which we'll talk about later today, and a secondary antibody, and actually stain for the GFP, okay, and be able to use an Alexa dye, something really bright that the confocal can 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 view. So the nice thing about this is, again, you wouldn't have the bleaching problems then. It won't work live for the most part, but at least on fixed cells, it's a nice alternative. You think your G, especially sometimes your GFP is just, for whatever reason, very, very weak. Like you're not getting good expression, but it's there. So if you go in with an antibody to boost up that signal with the bright Alexa floor four, then you know, then you can salvage that experiment. I'm always into trying to salvage an experiment instead of trying to do whatever if possible. The one I would recommend, I've you know, been doing this a long time, worked with a lot of people. This antibody, for whatever reason, it's a polyclonal it seems to pretty much always work for us. I mean, there's always little variations in GFP from different companies and such, but this one seems to work quite a bit. So I'd you know, recommend, if you only had enough money to buy one and try it, this, this one always seemed to help us a lot. We had really good luck with it. So does that all make sense about how GFP will die, but you can sort of recover it by using an antibody stain? Okay. okay. So... Again, what we just talked about, the idea of photo bleaching. You are hitting GFP with like a UV light, more or less, and it can't harm the cells. You can get a sunburn out of that, okay? Which, like, hopefully I won't get one while I'm here. Okay. So the reason I bring this up is, again, we want to do live cell experiments, right? And a lot of times with live cell experiments, the ultimate, the, the end point is you'd like to have a little movie at the end, like a time lapse. You know, they look nice. You put it in a PowerPoint, everybody goes, wow, look at that, that's really cool. So by wanting to do something like that, you're gonna have to repeatedly hit the GFP with light to get your you know, different frames of your movie, right? So what you gotta do is you gotta think this out a little bit. Uh, you gotta think about GFP in a time lapse. Yes, it works, but you know, let's be smart about this. What are some things we can do to, to ensure success, to maximize our possibilities of having a successful experiment? because you want to avoid what we've said here the last few days, phototoxicity. You want to try to avoid that. I was getting carried away with the animations. You watch as we keep going, there'll be more and more and more because I started learning PowerPoint better and better and better. But none of that stuff where you get dizzy, okay? I promise I won't do anything like that, okay? Okay, I don't think anyway. I didn't get that good. Okay, so we talked about phototoxicity, so it seems like a good segue into live cell imaging. So now we're going to use the idea of GFP and start talking about live cell stuff. Okay. Okay. So you don't always have to have something fluorescent to get a lot of information. This is just phase contrast stuff. And what we were looking at here, we were just, I think, if I remember right, we had another well. And we were just looking at how fast the cells were dividing, how you know, rapidly they were dividing in the presence of one drug versus another. And you didn't need to get into dies and you didn't need to get into anything fancy and as you've probably heard me the last few days if I can do it the simple way I'd much prefer to do it the simple way I got a lot of better chance for success I don't have to put as much time and effort into it so what we did here is basically we just you know we took the samples which is phase contrast 
Okay, nothing fancy, but it answered the question they wanted to answer. So, you know, it was more than sufficient. We didn't have to get all carried away. Okay. And it looks pretty cool, too. Okay, so some things to keep in mind when you actually set up a live cell experiment. Okay, first off, without a doubt, like I've said repeatedly, are your cells healthy? Do they look, you know, like when you're culturing them, always keep an eye on when you're culturing them. You know, you, you'll get a handle on how they look, how they look in the normal state. You'll, you'll know when they're dying. You'll know when they're overgrown. You start seeing the floaters in the tissue culture, right? You'll, you'll get a handle on how they look and how they behave. If you go to start doing transfections with GFP and stuff, they don't look healthy, uh, you know, don't bother. I mean, you want to start with healthy cells. It just, I mean, it just makes sense, but people, for whatever reason, try to force things to happen. They'll work with cells that aren't, you know, optimally healthy. Uh, so, you know, make sure they're healthy to start with. Because when you transfect, always, you know, you're bringing a piece of DNA into the cell across the membrane. You're hurting the cells, without a doubt. You will kill cells in the process. And if they're already injured, you're going to kill a lot more. So remember, healthy cells to start with, it's not worth the time and the effort if they look bad to start with. Okay, always, again, you always keep hearing me say this again and again, just, you know, what are we trying to answer? What are we trying to do? What's our question? Think, think about it before you start, always. Okay, now, what is my question? Like we saw some talks on calcium imaging, how long? Okay, calcium experiments might go for just a few seconds, okay? Uh, can I answer my question in minutes? Is this the kind of thing I might have to go three or four hours? Will, will this drug act in three or four hours? Or am I trying to look at cell death over time or, or some process that might take a couple days? Okay, you've got to take all these temporal things into account to see, you know, to sort of start to design the experiment before you even actually, you know, step up to the microscope and start doing the work. The, I think the most important thing, like many things, is the preparation. If you do the preparation correctly, then, you know, you have a lot better chance of success. Okay, so again, live cell's cool, it's neat, it's fun. Um, I mean, I like it, it gets to be a cool movie. But do I really need it? Is, do I have to go to the effort of making a GFP construct of my protein? Do I have to do that, or can I just get away with staying with the antibodies? Okay, so again, you know, think out, is this, is this what I really need to do? I mean, nothing wrong with doing live cell, but think about it, you have to get the incubator, you have to have the equipment. You have to do the transfections. I mean, if I could just throw a couple antibodies on, like, you know, maybe have a time point zero, a four-hour time point, eight-hour time point, will that give me the answer I need as opposed to filming the thing for eight hours? Okay. Oh, my glasses are hitting it. Thank you. Okay, so again, should I use a GFP? Should I use a cell-based stain? We'll be talking about these a little bit more time coming up. Or am I looking at a particular organelle? Okay, again, what is the question? If I want to look just at mitochondria, there's dyes out there now that we're going to talk about in a little bit that they track right to the mitochondria. You don't have to build some kind of GFP system to look at mitochondria. There's, there's other ways to do it. Okay, again, what are we doing? Like we saw these talks today. Do you want to measure calcium? Do you want to measure pH? Anytime you get into this kind of stuff, these measuring things, I think it's really good to go find somebody who's done it and get a little advice because these aren't, again, not trivial kind of things. It's, yeah, you could probably do it on your own, but it's always nice to have somebody who's been there and done that that can, you know, sort of hold your hand, help you out, and, and explain, like I'm explaining here to you, the, the problems I see, the, you know, the problems you'll encounter and how to overcome those hurdles. It'll save you a lot of time and effort if you find that person who really knows. Like... I mean, I've done calcium imaging, I've done these kind of things, but there's a guy on campus who's, you know, that's what he does, that's what his lab does. So people come to me in my core and they go, like, you do calcium imaging? And I said, well, why don't you go talk to Dr. Lamb first and then come back and talk to me because he'll, you know, point you in the right direction, tell you some of the pitfalls and, and, and good points of what you're trying to do or explain to you it's not going to work right off the bat. And then you and I can talk about the imaging part. But talk to him first because he's just way more knowledgeable than I am about these things. Again, the idea of science is a team, team effort now. Okay, other things you gotta think about, obviously. What magnification will I need? Higher mag? Maybe, but anytime you got higher mag, you have less cells in the field of view too, right? 
do I need to look at a population of cells to get my answer, or do I just need to look at a detail within just a few cells? And do I need a wide field microscope or a confocal? We've talked about this a little bit. Uh, a lot of times you might be able to get away with the fluorescent, just a normal wide field microscope, or do you need the confocal? Okay, and I hope we've you know, taught you enough that you sort of have an idea you know, which one to look at, that which scope you'd probably pick. Okay, now, another one I get a lot is people want to do some kind of cell death experiment. And the problem with those is that's fine, and there's nothing wrong with it. You want to see when the cells die, but will they all just float away? And will you be able to image them? So a lot of times if somebody comes up to me and says they want to do this experiment, they want to kill the cells or whatever, I say, well, you know, you might want to think about maybe using something like flow cytometry instead where you put the cells through a hose to see if they're dead because then you get all the cells in the culture instead of the ones that are still stuck on the plate. So something to think about. Okay. So this was brought up in one of the other talks this week that if you're doing a long-term, especially a high mag kind of uh, time lapse, then it's hard to keep focus. Okay. Uh, so what they've come up with, there's two ways to go about it is you can autofocus. Now what autofocus does is it'll, you basically give the microscope a range and it will take every picture in that range and keep it. So if it drifts a little, you could keep all those planes. But the problem is each time you're going up and down in Z, you're actually hitting it with light every time. You're taking multiple pictures more than you need because you're taking a bunch of out of, out of focus ones also. So that obviously would add more damaging light, sunburn, hurt the cells. So what they've come up with, it's expensive, don't get me wrong. Uh, I didn't have the money to buy one right away. I'd love to buy one, though. Is I got into it a little bit too early that they just started coming out after I had my scope like three or four years. But this idea of a perfect focus, where basically what they're doing is it's a setup where it will measure the distance to the cover glass. So if the specimen drifts, it'll correct it and it'll always find that exact same plane. So it will stay in focus for days and days and days over time. Okay, now like we said, it's expensive, but you know, doing a four-day experiment where you have nothing but a bunch of blur, that's expensive too, and a waste of time. So you know, it's something to think about. If, you know, if you're really gonna work on live cell constantly, if that's gonna be the heart of the, you know, your research, then definitely you want to go with something like this perfect focus. The technology is there to fix these problems. You might as well take advantage of it. Uh, all the big companies have this now. Okay, so it's out there. The technology is out there. I, and anytime things come out, I, I don't know the price at the moment, but I'm sure it's starting to go down. I think when it first came out, it was like twenty-five thousand to add it on. So who knows what it is now? But I'm sure it's less. Okay. And I've seen these other things. I brought it up just because I've seen them. There's a couple on our campus. Some people brought images off it over to me to do analysis on. And I mean, I can't really comment on how well they work, but I've, I've gotten images off them, okay? And I've done analysis, so to some extent they work. It's sort of like microscope in a box. It's sort of like, it's just designed with, it's an incubator box basically, and it's just like a one-step system. Like you, you're basically putting them in a little incubator. It's got some kind of lenses. It takes the pictures over time. Uh, again, don't know how well it works. A lot of times, if you're thinking of things like this, now I don't know how it works in India. I'll be the first one to admit that. Obviously, I don't know. But in America, I used to have to do demonstrations all the time. When I was in sales, I had to bring in the equipment and I had to demonstrate that it would work because people were spending you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars and you know, I'd bring in my, obviously my really, really pretty slide and I'd make everything look really, really pretty and really, really nice and you know, give them that wow factor. But my really, really pretty slide isn't your sample, okay? So people want a demonstration on their sample to make sure it would work. So anytime you get a demonstration, you know, I mean, I was a salesman, okay? And we all know the idea of a salesman is to sell. So, you know, obviously we do everything we could to make everything look good, but if, if you do have the point where you get to demonstrate, like if somebody brings in something trying to sell it, and bring your samples, okay? Bring your conditions, because that's the only real way you're gonna get a handle on if it's gonna work for you. Okay, like I said, I don't know how it works here in India, but back then, where I was in Cleveland, we had a lot of competition. I'd, I'd have to bring mine in, 
the Olympus guy would bring his in, the Leica guy would bring his in. You know, we'd fight it out on who could do a better job and price and everything else. So, like I said, this I don't really know about. I know they're cheaper, but it, it might be an alternative. Okay? And if you can get a demonstration, all the better to make sure it works for you. Okay, this is my setup, basically. This probably looks familiar, huh? Yeah, I would think so. Okay. Uh, so, basically, this is the incubator box. The reason I went with the box was, uh, like, I think somebody brought up yesterday the idea of thermal drift. If everything's not at the same temperature, you might get some thermal drift. And obviously, the thermal drift's a little, maybe just a little, but it's a microscope, so a little is a lot. Uh, so, usually, if we're going to do a live cell experiment or something, I try to get this on like two or three hours early, get all my holders in there, get everything I need in there so the whole system comes up to temp. Okay. And it does a really good job of holding the temperature. I mean, I can hold 37 for days. And then you can't really see it. Back in the back of the room, I have a CO2 tank that feeds into this bubbler here. And then I have like a sort of like a cover that sits over the chamber. I don't put CO2 in the whole chamber, but I put CO2 right at the sample. Okay, so I can put CO2 right at the sample. This setup a few years back was in the, I think I got it for like, 21,000, 22,000, something like that. Uh, there's other alternatives. You saw some of those yesterday with those little holders stuff. I'm going to show you a couple here, too. Uh, again, demonstration or, you know, a friend's advice, a colleague's advice. Hey, this works. Use this. You know, it, it goes a long way instead of trying to try it on your own always. Okay. So, like I've said, I've sold a couple of these in the past. The customers were happy with them. They seemed to like them. But there's these stage top incubators too, okay, uh, that sort of just fit over the top of the stage. Obviously, it's got to be compatible with your stage. Uh, you know, there's a lot of components going to the microscope system because there's all these different vendors, all these different stages, all these different parts. So, like I said, it's, it's really nice to have a representative from a company that really knows what he's talking about. We're fortunate in Cleveland. We have a guy who's been doing it for like 23 years, and he's really good, knows this stuff, and you know, gives me a lot of advice and, and usually sets me in the wrong, in the right direction. Okay, now, how to, like, what are you going to do your live cell imaging in? Okay, I mean, you can do plates. Now, plastic, you can't really do plastic on the confocal. Okay, the laser is just, they don't like the plastic. So you're always going to want to try to go through glass. Any time in microscopy that you can go through glass, the better. I mean, just, that's just the way it is. Glass, with the refractive indexes and such, it just works better, okay? And remember we talked about the cover glass thickness, 1.5. You always want 1.5 thick too. All the optics are designed to look through that kind of glass. So, I mean, if you're doing low mag, you know, 5X, 10X, something like that, yeah, you can get away with, you know, in a wide field, you can get away with some kind of plate. I hate 96 well plates. I just don't like them. They just, the light just bounces all over in them. It's really hard to tell which well you're in when you're looking at them. They're just, they're hard. They're fertilizers, okay, the way I look at it. But, but they do have, now don't get me wrong, they do have cover glass bottom 96 well plates too. So if you have to do, you know, something on a, like a high throughput kind of application, you do have to use a microscope. They do have them with glass bottom. They're quite expensive, but that is available. Okay. Really like these little dishes. Uh, they have that 1.5 thick cover slip. The cover slip's actually built right into the dish. Uh, the the uh, the coating inside the dish is just like tissue culture plate, more or less. So the cells will stick. The cells will behave. It's not like culturing on glass. It's more like culturing on plastic, which the cells usually behave better. Uh, I used to get a lot from Mat Tech. They'd run I don't know six seven dollars a piece, something like that. They worked. They were good. Okay, now this company came out, I don't know, six, seven, eight years ago. I met the rep even, came to Cleveland. These are nice. I mean, these you can get like all these different formats. They have all these different migration setups and stuff. You guys used to use them, I think, right? Yeah, you guys definitely use them for migration even, I think. Yeah. So proof here that they actually do work. Uh, but the nice thing is you could do, literally, you get an eight well one. You do eight experiments in the same plate. The bottoms are like cover slips, so you have that high quality imaging. But the nice thing is, again, on the inside, they behave like plastic, so the cells 
behave on them. They, they act like a tissue culture thing. So you could do, and the other nice thing is you could do your whole experiment here. You could do your staining, everything else.